Hello, Internet! Welcome to episode 220 of the Soda Calibers podcast, the second minute podcast that is a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and with me tonight is my extremely lovely hostess, Erin Paulette. How are you doing, Erin? Well, unlike one of us here, I haven't had a vacation recently. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I, could, I mean, I, you had a vacation, so you're like, you know, rested and relaxed, tanned and to- well, no, probably not tanned. <laughs> I, I, I am actually quite tanned, thank you very much. I, really? Okay. I spent I spent I spent multiple hours swimming in the ocean with my daughter, so so yeah, no, I'm uh and of course I've really been staying the living like we had a really hot, nasty summer and so I've just been staying the hell out of the and well and my grass has I've mowed my lawn three times this year. <laughs> which is alarming. Normally it's once a week, but we've gotten so little rain and it was so hot that just the grass just went, no, we ain't growing. And I, I just want to point out that, that you're complaining about having a hot and nasty summer in Massachusetts. And so then on vacation, you head south where it's going to be hotter and therefore nastier. But you had a great time. Yes. Well, uh, uh, alarmingly enough, no, it was not. It was actually the the coldest and nastiest it's 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 been on in Carolina Beach in the five or so years we've been we've been doing this little Columbus Day journey, and uh, like I think I think Ian kicked up a lot of uh, you know kicked up a lot of big waves, which probably churned up the thermocline. So the ocean water was like ten degrees colder than it, it usually is in the eighties this time of year, and it was in the seventies, the low seventies. And then when we got there, oh my God, the wind was coming off the ocean at a very, pretty high clip, and it was just it was just chilly and nasty. And I'm just like, oh God, I only packed shorts and a t-shirt. I felt <laughs> very much the same way of when uh, when my wife and I went to the Grand Canyon, and I looked at the weather and was like, oh, it's going to be 90 every day. I'm going to dress really really light and realize that oh, it's the desert, which means when the sun goes down, it suddenly goes down to 50. Hmm. <laughs> So I want to tell our listeners, weird, you've already heard this. So yeah, last week we didn't have an episode because weird was on vacation and other people were having a blog shoot and I was just left alone. And so I thought, well, how hard can it be? I'm going to do an episode all by myself and I'm going to record it. And it'll be simultaneously a trick and a treat for Weird, because the trick will be, ha ha, I don't need you, I did an episode. And the treat being, look, I did an episode while you were on vacation, we're not going to miss one. And may I I note that uh, that you are, this is is being released for the regular listeners uh, on Halloween, so (laughs) even better on the trick or treat. Thank you, Eric. Oh, well. A note to our listeners, this episode is being released the week before Halloween. So please all chuckle along at how stupid Weird Beard is, given that he does not know how to read a calendar. Great. And so I put the show notes together and I assembled the topics and I listened to the segment and I thought I was ready. And I started talking and, um, well, I got done in 30 minutes and it wasn't a good 30 minutes either. It wasn't a solid. There were a lot of times where it was just a, well, like that. I would be talking and it would just be, uh, uh, all right, what do I do? And a lot of times that's when weird motor mouth beard will tag in and say something. and It'll give me time to collect my thoughts. And I didn't have that. <laughs> it, it, it was sort of the podcast equivalent of that dream in high school where you show up and you're naked and you haven't studied for the test. It was just, I, uh, uh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and then just, I, I got through the segments way too fast. I, I was trying to slow it down, but that didn't happen. And it was just awful. And uh, it, no, it's not going to show up in the blooper reel. It's not going to be for paid. No, I take that back. I am mercenary at heart. You pay me enough. You can listen to it. Make me an offer. But uh, <laughs> but but uh, unless an offer is made, it's not going to be released for patrons. And it was bad. And so it gave me a little more appreciation for what Weird brings to the show. 
So I, I kick him in the crotch a lot because he enjoys it. But I, I have to say this, and I couldn't do it without you, weird. Well, Aaron, I, I will say that it's not just it's it's not just uh, it's not just me. I am not the, somehow the magic glue that holds this all together because I've I was while you were saying this, I was racking my brain and trying to think of when I made my first podcast appearance. Uh, but it was, you know, some something to the effect of like 12 years ago. And uh, and uh, every single one I, for, I first showed up as like guests on podcasts and then I started hosting uh, ho- hosting shows, but it was always ensemble cast shows. And I've never, ever, ever done a show alone with the exception of when you hear me do the weird audio fisks. That's those are that's a pre-recorded segment. And so that's just me all alone. And that is well, yeah. But you also have a script, and mm-hmm. reading from a script is different from winging the presentation of the podcast as a whole. Yeah. If if I ad lib in any number one, ninety percent of the weird audio fisks you hear have absolutely zero ad lib in them, and then of that ten percent, it's like three words max. It, it's it's just not a thing. Like yeah, it just sitting down and i'm going to do a podcast and there's people that do that and we talked talked about you know the the, the, ver- the various podcasters that just do it all on their own and let me tell you that's a that's a skill that i don't have and uh and 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 that's tough and i know <laughs> I know I, I Ryan Machad started off handgun radio as a, as a solo show. And like, as soon as he had me on as I could just contact him. Hey dude, I'm from Maine too. <laughs> have, have me on. I'll talk about Massachusetts gun laws. And, uh, and, and he had me on, we talked about Massachusetts gun laws. And next thing you know, he's like, you want to come on for the next one? And at first I'm like, Oh, okay am i just like a perpetual guest what's the story and then then there's a couple of times where he got some guests on and he didn't contact me like oh i guess he doesn't like me anymore and then finally it's one of those like nah officially you're the co-host it was uh (laughs) it went on from there but he's like yeah i don't want to sit there talking talking to myself to the microphone it's just it's too hard but yeah that was uh (laughs) i i i want to hear it i haven't heard it i i may have to make aaron an offer (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh so uh yeah we have some uh we have some news stories mm-hmm. and 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 I'll, I'll tell you right now you picked them all out and uh i skimmed them but uh you may have to take me gently by the hand but i am here to help you Aaron Paulette. <laughs> this first one here is on the federal judge halts key parts of new york's gun law so wait does does that mean that 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 yay now i can conceal carry in times square well unfortunately no and that's no to several parts well unfortunately weird the answer is no so we have linked in the show notes it's called document number 27 in this particular case and while this federal judge found that certain aspects of new york's concealed carry improvement act improvement act uh, which include, among other things, the uh, the social media provision, uh, have been found unconstitutional. They haven't been struck down. It's not the absolute victory that, that a lot of people think it is. Instead, they have merely been temporarily restrained from enforcement for two weeks until the judge can hear more detailed arguments from both sides. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but based upon my interpretation of it, this basically means that the judge has said, until the case has been decided in court, these laws are on hold. Now, some people may be feeling very dumb, and you know what? That's that's understandable. That's forgivable, because I lay the blame squarely at the feet of Many, many reputable outlets who have been publishing this story by uh, Michael Hill of the Associated Press and and the author, while being technically correct, leaves out some very important uh, specifics. I mean, he states federal judge halts key part of New York's gun law. Well, okay, yes, he did halt it, but he only halted it temporarily. And that multiple provisions in the state law passed this year are unconstitutional. Well, yes, that's why he halted them. 
but it's not permanent. It hasn't been permanently struck down. And so they paint a false image by not mentioning that it's temporary, that they don't mention it's a restraining order. And so just like pretty much every other time the media talks about guns or gun laws, you need to verify from original sources whenever possible. And so the state of New York has predictably appealed this ruling. Uh, They were given three business days, and I'm certain that they worked throughout the, the Columbus Day weekend in order to have an appeal worked up. And I don't know if they submitted it on Tuesday or Wednesday, but they absolutely have. And so now that they've appealed... Um, I, I believe that the temporary restraining order is now annulled because they had to appeal. So they've begun that process. So it's good news because it shows that we have a judge who, while maybe not specifically uh, predisposed towards being pro 2 way, this judge clearly isn't anti 2 way. So we're going to get a fair shake here. But it's not the absolute victory that a lot of news outlets and hopeful gun owners think that it is. Yeah, this is just part of that long road where (laughs) the court did the right thing and said the Second Amendment means what it says. God damn it. And uh, and now the anti-gun groups. And of course, this only really affects a handful of the small number of anti-gun states that are left because she's <laughs> most of the country like is, is, uh, is, is adopting constitutional carry and just say, yeah, no, we don't care. Just, just keep a bare arms and have, have a good time with it. Don't hurt anybody. And, uh, unless they deserve it. And, and so this, we have that such pol- polarity where, you know, one part of the country is saying, yeah, as soon as, as soon as you turn 18 or 21, Go ahead and carry your gun however you want to carry it, as many magazines and all that, to now New York saying, no, 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 somebody has to give you permission to do that. And most of the sidewalks you can't carry on and none of the public transportation and none of this and none of that. And you have to do this and you have to take a trading course that doesn't exist, but you have to do it in Canada. And it's just I don't, it's they're being absolutely ridiculous. And of course, it's infuriating because. This whole case was against specifically New York. It has implications to me in Massachusetts and people in Connecticut, New Jersey, and California at all, at all, at all. But New York itself is saying, no, uh, and, uh, but it- so actually this, this leads into the very next topic. And it's again, it's about New York. And so one of the places that New York has said you can't carry because it's a sensitive area is in places of worship. Now, we touched upon this briefly in, I think it was episode 217, something like that, where the Jewish group was going to uh, sue New York for banning guns in houses of worship because no one's ever shot up a synagogue before. Mm -hmm. But now other people, other churches are getting in on this. And so 25 churches across New York State have filed lawsuit over this particular aspect of the Concealed Carry Improvement Act. So we've got 25 Christian churches. We've got, I'm not quite sure, I don't remember how many um, Jewish uh, synagogues are, or Jewish groups are suing. At this point, I, I would really like to see some mosques sue as well Mm -hmm. and so we would have the three largest religions within the united states uh all suing the state of new york over this and i think that would be delightful and then just to put the cherry on top the second amendment foundation the the winningness organization when it comes to this sort of thing has also filed suit in federal court against new york about the church, well, house of worship, gun carry prohibition. And so you've got Jewish groups, you've got Christian groups, you've got the Second Amendment Foundation. New York is going to get spanked hard. Absolutely. And just the sheer idea that by banning firearms in such and such a location will will somehow eliminate 
the 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 idea of spree killing or violence within that location is just an exercise in absolute stupidity given that hey guess what the gun free schools school act was 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 created in 1994 and then columbine happened in 1999 and then all the copycat school shootings started just flying through, you know, flying through the roof. And we have the whole term going postal in <laughs> federal postal facilities, which are gun free zones. I don't even know when that was first enacted. And so the idea of, oh, we will protect these these religious groups for worship by banning their their access to firearms when Hey, look, check it out. The, you know, the vast majority of spree shooters go to places where arms are restricted and, uh, and, and, and a, a good chunk now, thankfully, who go to places where arms are not restricted, get their skulls hollowed out in, in, in a sharpish manner. So I wish, I wish them luck. And I mean, in a sane world, like they'll, they'll win this walking away, but unfortunately that's not the world we live in. So. I am actually glad this is happening. I am glad that New York is putting up a fight, and here's why. If New York and all the other states rolled over, I mean, that would be great in the short term, but it would still leave an opportunity for this to be challenged later. Okay, we're just going to lie dormant for a while, and then in five years, in ten years, when a lot of the uh, SCOTUS has rotated out, when Judge Thomas has retired, we'll try and float this again, and maybe we'll succeed, and maybe we won't. And they would and and they might succeed with a different court composition. But because they're trying to do this now, they're going to get spanked by this SCOTUS. And there's going to be precedent upon precedent. And the more precedent is layered on, the it's going to be that much harder for other states to fight. New York has decided that it's going to be the whipping boy and they are going to get beaten hard. And the more they fight and the more they're spanked, the more other states are going to go, you know, eh, we're good. Thanks. And so I think it's worth it going through this immediate pain now in order to have a very solid foundation for gun rights later on. I think the the easy immediate victory would be a lot weaker and would leave this open to to challenges or um you know slow erosion of rights. But if we can get this very firm foundation from the from the Supreme Court, I think it's going to be well, it's never going to be impossible, but it's going to be a lot harder for the gun prohibitionists to chisel away at this. Also, that adversarial effect is really, really good at motivating us because uh, I, I, I must say that uh, gun owners, and I don't know if this is all true, I, I don't know the full mechanism of action, but it's certainly been stated that gun owners are really, really good at lying on their laurels when things are going well. And this, especially, I just noted the polarity of gun laws in this country where things are going extremely well in the vast majority of this country as far as gun owners and their right to own whatever guns they want to own and carry guns wherever they want to carry them and uh, without permits in many cases or with minimal permitting. And this is showing that, no, there are, you know, dark forces living, living, living in our coastal cities. And, uh, yeah, the, we, we need, we need to fight back and we need to be vigilant because these people just have no shame with, with the amount that they will go to, to, to harm gun owners and to, and, and to keep their monopoly on force. And so. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It, it sucks that that this that uh, NYSERPA went through and it wasn't an immediate boon for for gun owners in America. Uh, instead, it was just kind of a uh, there's kind of a random walk. Some stuff went good. Some stuff went way worse. And uh, but this will allow us to fight it and really settle the science, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it's because it some of these tests are great because you think about it. You know, the first major gun control law that restrict 
the arms and the people to have them, uh, you know, in this country was the NFA, which was, was that 1932? I've, I, th- I, I think it was, it was either 34 or 36. Okay. But let, let me Google. Yeah. It was, in, it was in the thirties. And up until then we went from, yes, we, you know, we were, we were fighting the English with, with, with flint locks and then the cap lock came along and then the metallic cartridge and then the repeating arms and then large capacity guns like the, you know, the Henry rifle and all that, which was really the, the AR 15 of the, you know, of the mid uh, 19th century. And all of these instances are going through at no point. There's no laws that say you can't care. You know, you can't own a Henry rifle in Illinois. You can't own a Henry rifle in New York. You can't own a Henry rifle in Georgia. It's, it's just these vast jumps you know the 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 percussion revolver and then the cartridge revolver all of these guns that were just leaps and bounds ahead of the guns that our founding fathers fought the english uh, and, and won our independence with went through and they never felt the need to do restrictions and then the first restriction they have is on like legitimate military military hardware you know artillery and machine guns and then they had the short barrel rifles and the short barrel shotguns because they wanted to ban handguns as well but that didn't work out and then and then the suppressors because they were worried starving uh, people in the great depression were gonna shoot the king's deer and uh and and feed their families and we can't have that oh, the nfa is a terrible lot it needs to go away but 1934 excellent thank you so much aaron uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, and so it went all the way from, you know, 1791 to 1934. And I forget which year the, the 14th Amendment was ratified. But uh, but all of, the, you know, all of this time and all of these innovations that had happened in firearms, you know, literally we went from flintlock muskets to, you know, full auto machine guns and submachine guns in technology and artillery shells. and and at no point in time are there the petty laws that exist in the country now. And so the idea that, that the founding fathers just could never have thought about that stuff. I mean, they had plenty of time as, as it was happening, they weren't going, you know what? We're getting to repeating arms. Jeez. You know, what if they come up with an AR 15? That'd be really bad. No, nobody, nobody, nobody cared. And the AR-15 was around for, what, 30 years before someone decided to start putting bans on it. Uh, so it, it's... Well, well, I mean, both the Puckle gun and the Girondoni air rifle existed at the time mm-hmm. of the writing of the Second Amendment. So, you know, it's not like this was completely unknown to the founders. Also, since I've interrupted here, the 14th Amendment was... Um, ratified in 1868 okay so the 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 henry the henry rifle came about in 1860 so it had been almost a decade of of the 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 yankee rifle that they load load on sunday and shoot all week so yeah the there was a a ton of innovations and force multipliers including things that we thought were super scary on rate of fire increases and uh and uh, and magazine capacity that the anti-gunners seemed to think was completely beyond the scope of our founding fathers but as you said gerondoni air rifle had like like a 20 or 30 round magazine and uh and you know you could you could it was essentially a lever action so you could shoot it just as fast as you could work the lever and uh and the puckle gun was essentially a giant manual revolver but it it could have i think up to like 20 or 30 shots in that thing but either way it was there were there, there was a whole bunch of stuff that was not a <laughs> a a a uh a brown best musket that takes th- you know thirty to fifty seconds to load for for a fast shooter and sometimes minutes for for someone like us that aren't super versed in muzzle loaders. <laughs> so yeah, the it should be obvious, but clearly they're fighting and they're not they're not giving it up. So I guess we got to drive them into the ocean. And uh, yeah, I'll 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 be really sad to see them crushed and decimated. <laughs> And hear the lamentations of the wee man. <laughs> exactly. See them driven before me. <laughs> oh, so 
we got one last story here. And I, mm-hmm. I don't even know what this is. Let me click on it. Because like I said You haven't read it? Um Oh, I, I, I had I had not read the story, but I, I'm familiar with this news report. Yes, I will read the headline. Massive errors in FBI's active shooter reports regarding cases where civilians stop attacks. Instead of 4.4%, the correct number is at least 34.4%. Uh, and it is at least 49.1%. Actually, I heard an interview with John Lott uh, talk, t- talking, talking about this. Well, see, funny you should mention him because he's the person who wrote this. Mm-hmm. This is from Crime prevention research what's the c stand for um crime prevention research center center there you go and so for anyone who knows anything about dr john lott you know that he does extensive and thorough research and vets it and he shows his work um i originally found out about this from a link to a Fox News article, and I know that a lot of our listeners don't like Fox News, and, well, just like I said, when it comes to something about guns, I don't trust what the media says, regardless of their slant. I wanted to find out from the original source, and I follow the original source, and it leads to Dr. Lott. And so... I think pretty much just on his on the strength of his reputation, you can believe this. But if you don't want to and you shouldn't, um, you can go and research it yourself. And it is really interesting in that, yeah, um, the FBI massively undercounts um, incidents in which, you know, non-police officers you know, the good guys with the gun, stop active shooters. And this comes down to two things. One, the FBI misclassifies. And this can show up in a variety of different ways. Um, One of them is, well, the shooter ran away and the police captured him. So really the police stopped the shooter. Which is distasteful. I can understand how they came to that conclusion, but that strikes me as the police version of <laughs> stolen valor. This is very similar um, to the the news story that was all over itself in the um, uh, uh, Jean Assam. I, her newer last name was Assam, but uh, this was one of those stories that had like a super. They were they were twisting any way they could, but it was uh, it was out in Colorado. And this guy had a serious problem with Christians. So he went to a Christian youth camp and shot a bunch of people there and then and then decided to go to the mega church associated with his camp and shoot that place up. And they were on high alert because they were aware of the previous shooting. And so when the guy was when the guy was in the parking lot uh, trying to come into the church, he was immediately spotted by one of the members of the congregation who drew her gun and shot him uh, and uh, and stopped the attack. And I believe he, he unfortunately, he was discovered after he, I believe, shot two people there. And so uh, unfortunately, it wasn't it wasn't a clean stop, but it was still pretty darn good and uh, way better than it could have been just to let him go and way better than it could have been if they were following New York's laws and just saying you can't have guns on church property. But uh, number one, the news went nuts in pointing out the fact that this woman who was just, uh, she was working as a security guard. They were, they had identified her as someone to keep an eye out on things, but she was just a member of the congregation with a concealed carry permit. But at one time in her life, she had been a police officer. So she was a former police officer mm-hmm. and somehow that made a big deal. And then the next point was that while she had shooted shot, shooted <laughs> IR smart uh, while she had shot the, uh, the shooter and wounded him. He then immediately took his gun and ended his own life with it. So they pointed out, no, she didn't stop him. He just killed himself as mm-hmm. if that was the whole point. He was going there to shoot two people and then blow his own brains out. Mm-hmm. No, he was there to shoot a whole bunch of people and probably would have blown his brains out when he got sick of killing people. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he got he got <laughs> she did the old control alt delete and, st- and ended his mm-hmm. fun. 
But yeah, that that's actually another example that's listed here. A lot of times the FBI will incorrectly interpret the um incorrectly interpret these good guys with the gun as security personnel as if that makes a difference and and they specifically mention uh Jack Wilson who uh did the amazing headshot across the church sanctuary in White Settlement and the FBI listed him as a security guard and he's not he specifically told Dr. Lott he's not a security personnel that about uh, 20 members of the congregation were armed that day and, you know, they didn't have specific security. It was just people who decided to carry. Uh, but that's that's the first example uh, or factor. The second one, and honestly, this one is worse, is that the FBI overlooks or misses cases. And, and there's a link within the document where it where where Dr. Lott says that the FBI has missed 25 incidents where what would have been a public shooting was thwarted by armed civilians. This is this is also nothing new. Um, may I direct everyone to, of course, Dr. Lott is well known for his his first book, which was uh, More Guns, Less Crime, which is absolutely amazing and and everyone should read it but he had a uh, i don't know if it was his second book but it was it was a subsequent book uh called the bias against guns and literally he was covering news news stories on defensive gun use and how the news agencies just absolutely avoid at all costs good guys with guns stop especially civilians uh stopping stopping bad people doing bad things uh, I'm skimming over this here, and I, like I said, I did not read this the, this whole article because I'm lazy. And I, I, Aaron, you deserve to shame me for that, and 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 you are carrying me on this. Does he mention? Do the FBI do uh, do the catch twenty two where well the killer didn't kill you know four or more people, so therefore it wasn't a mass shooting. So when Jack Wilson shot this guy after he killed two people in the church, well. He didn't stop a mass shooting. He just killed a murderer. Because certainly I know a while ago, I remember reading uh, Dr. Lott. This is before crime prevent, uh, 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 crime prevention research uh, had, uh, had, had been started. Uh, he talked about how there were several instances where it was very clearly someone who was getting ready for do, to do a killing spree, but they got mm -hmm. stopped in their tracks very, very early on in, uh, in some instances, one instance I think was, was, uh, in Illinois where somebody was walking into traffic with a rifle and an Uber driver pulled out a gun and shot them before they could even kill anybody. But it's one of those, what were you doing? And just recently we reported that, uh, that birthday party, incident where the guy was shooting at people in a park didn't end up hitting anybody but there was someone with a concealed mm -hmm. carry permit and their aim was considerably better uh but again what the hell were they trying to do <laughs> they they were not shooting at anybody that they specifically knew they were not shooting anyone they had a grudge against they were just shooting at people at a birthday party he was just looking for a body count and thankfully he was not given that so to answer your question I think that this is actually above and beyond that particular linguistic dodge because Dr. Lott specifically states, all right, the FBI defines active shooter incidents as those in which an individual actively kills or attempts. Wait, no. Breaking news. Huh. No, no, it's. Hang on a minute. OK, OK, I've, I've got a much better answer here. Um, so to answer your question, weird. This actually doesn't apply because you are confusing, and it's understandable the difference between like 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 um a spree killer or a mass shooter and an active shooter. And so, the the mass killer you have to kill or injure X number of people, but use the, the terminology Doctor Lott uses is the same as the FBI definition of an active shooter incident. Okay, so he's which he is, is sidestepping the catch twenty. Yes, yes. And so and and there is a link to an FBI document 
which specifically says the agreed upon definition of an active shooter by U.S. government agencies is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. There, there's nothing in there about the number of wounded or dead. Excellent. Well, that 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 is that is both good that uh, that this was the this was the methodology used, but bad that the FBI did such a terrible job with this methodology. <laughs> well, at this point, what do you expect from the FBI? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch that one. But yes, they have been really really horrible. Well, really, their entire existence. <laughs> oh, look up J. Edgar Hoover, people. <laughs> well, there, Aaron, Aaron, you have rehashed the the horrible memories of you doing attempting to do a solo show long enough. So, shall we? Uh, shall we bring on some uh, some uh, some friends of the show to uh, to to carry some of the weight? Yes, coming up, David does science to trash. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. In this segment, I'd like to talk about one of Oddball's most prized possessions, the Altor, or as I call it, the alleged firearm. The Altor is a single-shot, removable barrel, centerfire handgun, and I use the term handgun loosely. It's available in both 9mm and 380 ACP, with possibly more calibers coming in the future. It's basically a glorified veterinary humane killer. Loading the Altor is an interesting process in itself, as you have to partially pull the trigger before sliding a live round into the shell holder and replacing the barrel. I could go on, but I'd rather not. What niche this object is meant to fill, I'll leave up to the listeners to decide. One of the interesting aspects of the Altor is the rifling, which is only slightly more than theoretical. The following is an excerpt from the FAQ on the Altor website. Tumbling bullets and rifling. Tumbling bullets are completely normal. There are two reasons for this. First of all, the Altor pistol has an extremely short barrel, only 1.5 inches of actual barrel, since the rest of the barrel chamber includes the chamber and the front of the receiver. It's also because we only cut four microgrooves as rifling strictly for ATF compliance purposes. Microgrooves were patented by Marlin in the 1950s, so we knew they were legal and would prevent us from having a problem with the ATF because a smoothbore would be a short-barreled shotgun and restricted. The Altor pistol was submitted to the ATF during development, and they approved the rifling as within the legal requirements. But they really don't do much. For reference, the official SAMI specifications for 9mm barrels calls for six grooves, each of them 0.100 inches wide and approximately 0.011 inches deep. In contrast, the Altor barrel only has four grooves, and each of them is only 0.014 inches wide, and only 0.005 inches deep. These barrels have very substantial differences in rifling. The Altor pistol was only intended to be a close-quarters defense weapon or farm tool. According to FBI data, most gunfights occur in three seconds, involve three shots, and happen at three yards, nine feet. That was our design goal. Hit a center mass human sized target at nine feet, whether the bullet is tumbling or not. But it is incredibly more accurate than that, even with a tumbling bullet. Whether you are ringing steel at 18 to 25 yards, as some online reviewers have done, or just wanting to do some damage to flesh during a defense situation, a tumbling bullet seems to hit the target. And while penetration might be affected, the wound cavity would probably be worse. The only way to eliminate this would be to go to traditional rifling, which would increase the price substantially since it requires button rifling, which is a separate process. Therefore, we would never do it. An interesting challenge for owners of this object would be to get three hits on a silhouette target at three yards in three seconds, starting from an empty gun. Accomplishing this goal would be worthy of a challenge coin. However, with such shallow rifling, the question was posed as to how shot shells would behave in the Altor. Would they spread? Would the donut of death traditionally seen when shot loads are fired through rifled barrels make an appearance? To clarify, the donut of death is an area at the center of the shot pattern where no pellets hit. This is due to the action of rifling on the shot column causing it to spread away from the center, leaving a void. So we took the Altor to my backyard range with some targets, 9mm shot shells, and a tape measure. Because this was science and not screwing around, I also took pictures and notes. 
According to the CCI website, their 9mm shot shells are loaded with 53 grains of number 12 shot and have a velocity of around 1,450 feet per second. These loads are also commonly referred to as snake shot or rat shot. We fired the first round from a measured 9 feet using a B-29 silhouette target. This is a reduced scale target with an overall area of 11.5 inches wide by 22 inches tall. While the shot pulled slightly to the left, the Altor is not known for its quality trigger, pellet distribution was good with no significant voids in the pattern. Coverage was over nearly the entire target. Any snake or rat fired at from this distance would have caught at least a few pellets, though the hits would probably not be lethal. The second shot was fired from a measured 6 feet at a new target, and this is where things got really interesting. There was almost no pellet spread, and the plastic shot capsule hit very close to the main mass of pellets. While requiring decent aim and a better trigger pull than usually available on an Altor, this would certainly be lethal to a snake, rat, or other small animal fired at from this distance. Oddball is currently working on a 3D printed grip module designed by our friend Heinrich from Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns that provides not only a much better trigger pull, but also the ability to mount actual sights. Once the Altor is outfitted with these new parts, I'd be interested in revisiting this experiment. Remember kids, the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, Please post them on the Assorted Calibers Podcast Facebook or MeWe pages, and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. We're always looking for people interested in submitting posts to the blog, so please check out the site. Finally, I'm also a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the name Brenna Bock. That's B-R-E-N-A-B-O-C-K. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. I asked David if he would a while back, and those listening to a blooper reel, you've you, you've heard you've heard this discussion uh, to uh, uh, to cook up a, a squib hand load just to see if the rifling was deep enough to hold a bullet in the bore. We talked a little bit about about it before we started the show um as well and he didn't do that yet but he says that's coming in the near future and he's got like he's going way more in depth than that so this that will be very very interesting but i i gotta say this was a really really interesting study on a gun that is such an oddity one thing that i was amused by was when david listed the goals of the altor and and he was listing the rules of three and you know, three shots in three seconds at three yards or meters or whatever. And he observed it would be very difficult to get three shots out of an Altor in a timely manner. And honestly, the first thing I thought of was to do it pirate style and just have a brace of Altors. And just bang, drop, draw another one, bang. You know, I think that would be the fastest of all of them. But uh, in regards to Heinrich 3D printing a better housing for an Altor, uh, the phrase lipstick on a pig comes to mind, <laughs> as does polishing a turd. Yes. Though I gotta say, though, some I've I've seen some of Heinrich's uh, uh, three three D CAD files for for those, and they do look very interesting. And I I look forward to seeing. I think Oddball's printed up a couple of them, but he's having some trouble getting them to work. But uh, may, maybe there'll be a future uh, Oddball's Corner Pocket uh, discussion <laughs> on him finally getting a, a a new chassis for the Altor. Um, I, I just want to point out, people gave me just an absolute ration of crap. When I got an Archangel stock for my Mosin Nagant, and like you spent more for the stock than you did for the rifle, but it's still a perfectly good rifle. I mean, when when people who own an Altor say it's trash, they they love it, but it's still trash. I mean, I just I don't want to hear that from anyone ever again. 
<laughs> I've, I've I've always been a defender of your of your Mosin project because you you are you are making something unique and interesting with that gun. And while you are modifying the Mosin beyond its military capabilities, you've done nothing permanent to the gun. So therefore, you can always return it to it, it, its its original state, and therefore its original collector's value and historical significance. <laughs> like it has any collector's value didn't they make like four million of the things they did but my <laughs> god they're going up I, uh, a 90 a 91 30 round is yours a round receiver yes it is yeah 91 30 round receiver is like i think like nearly 200 bucks now <laughs> i'm not even gonna tell you what i paid for mine I, it wasn't it wasn't more than that I, I I will I I will openly say that because I have a CNR and I can get I can get them directly from the distributors. I've got several ninety one thirties for like seventy bucks a whack, and uh, yeah, now they're worth a whole a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I don't want to say what I paid for my new Remington, but I'm so happy to have it. But <laughs> but it's considerably more than that. But it's an American Mosin. <laughs> yeah, and also <laughs> I'm gonna say like. Getting a brace of Altors so that you could do this drill, but it's one of those like, okay, as much as we might say a gun like a like a Taurus or a Bursa or some of the other like bargain guns out there uh, are are you know are are not ideal. They're not that they're not they're not much they're not much they're more than twice the 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 uh, the market value of an Altor, and and yet they are a full on repeating arm. That also doesn't. I would. I would never want to reload an Altor at speed because you are running a very. This the barrel's not that long, and you're literally taking it off the gun. You are getting dangerously close. It, it's one of those that's super easy to put your hand in front of the muzzle, or at least close enough to the muzzle that if you do have a negligent discharge, you are going to do damage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, don't, don't, don't try to do that. Just get your Altor, and and use it for fun. And if if all you can afford is an Altor, like, just send me an email. I'll buy you a better gun. <laughs> if that's legitimately your statement is all you can afford is an Altor, then p- people will help you. Panhandle. People will buy you a high point, okay? A- exactly. I will buy you a Taurus Curve and I'll make you carry it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have shot one of those. How, they, how was it? It wasn't terrible, but... Okay, this is this is the kindest thing I can say, but it is honest. I liked the way they were thinking. I do too. It was a good idea executed poorly. As- it, it's a kind of thing that like, okay, if Keltec had come up with that, I would have gone, yeah, makes sense. But I think Keltec would have made it better. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they had the idea and they rejected it. I don't know. And, and for those that don't know, imagine a hip flask, except it was a three eighty pistol. That is the Taurus curve. And, and if you have never, have you never dropped a hip flask in your pocket, like they have a curve to them. You drop it into your pocket and it just kind of nestled around your leg and it doesn't print at all and all that. And that's exactly it. It's a brilliant design. But yeah, the ones that I've handled, I've never shot one, but the, uh, but I, I've handled them and, uh, they definitely have, have a high lacking for, uh, uh, in execution. I mean, okay. I can't say that they didn't have any iron sights, but because it was designed to be drawn from concealment, it, it doesn't have blade sights. It's got like some sort of a gutter groove thing you can sight through it's it's really bad now they make up for it by having a a laser integrated into the actual frame itself the thing is though it's not easy maybe it'd be easier if you had longer fingers but it was not easy for me to turn on now if they had a thing where you know you draw it and it automatically turns on that would be great but they didn't so no, <laughs> still better than an Altor. I, st- I still want an Altor, though. I hate saying that, but yes, it's still <laughs> better than an Altor. <laughs> so moving on to our next segment, David was just talking about Heinrich from Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns. Well, 
the other geek from Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns, Matt, is here to start a series on something near and dear to his heart. Virtual reality. Hi, Matt with Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns here with a little virtual segment for you. Now, we have all known for years through movies, TV, you name it, the entire idea of going into the computer, living in a virtual world, and letting your life be something completely different. Well, I will say that today, some of the biggest corporations in the world, Meta, that's right, Facebook renamed themselves Meta because they believe in it that much, and Apple are actually working on making technology and the real world combine. So Meta, they're talking about the metaverse. Mm. I don't know if their vision of what it's going to be like is going to be the real thing. There's two different kinds of tech. There is virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality is you put on a couple of screens. It's a lot like the Virtual Boy, only a thousand times better. Virtual Boy came out in 95, as Weird Beard has talked about, because he had one of those back in the day. And it was a couple of screens putting images straight up to your eyes. We'll go a bit deeper into the tech in future episodes. But suffice it to say, that was an early version of VR. And trust me, I've used VR for years. In the early 2000s, I remember going to Disney Quest. It was an entire idea of making Disney theme parks you can put in any town that are all virtual. It was really cool. It was basically a giant arcade. There was a VR lightsaber thing. Of course, they didn't own Star Wars stuff at the time. Um, there was design your own roller coaster, and then they were using screens and drums to simulate the motion of whatever roller coaster you made, and you put segments together. That was really cool. The thing died out after a few years, but it was a really neat idea trying to make the virtual world and the real world combine. Well, today you can have some of that at home, not all of it. Because honestly, trying to do all of it gets really difficult, but we are actually approaching the point where you can do it. Now, augmented reality, which that really seems to be the way Apple is looking to go with their headset, and Facebook's, aka Meta, formerly known as Oculus, their new headset that's coming out, I believe will be announced later this month, is known as Project Cambria right now. That seems to be more focused, at least what they're saying, towards business and augmented reality. That is where you see the world around you, but it is using the technology to overlay things on the real world, which is a really interesting idea. Some of the coolest demos came years ago from Microsoft with, let's see, I believe that was called HoloLens. The biggest issue Microsoft ever had with that is the field of view was very, very small, which means only a small area of what you could see would actually be covered and be able to interact. But it, like I said, the biggest companies in the world are all getting on board and thinking that this is going to be a bet. And I've been playing with this stuff for a couple years now. And you know what? I think there are massive possibilities. Honestly, when we started our show back 2014, Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns, uh, our first episode, we were talking about augmented reality and virtual reality stuff. I kind of wonder what it would be like today. Yeah, you can't exactly go and do the whole Ready Player One where you put on the headset and you have a treadmill that goes in every direction, but there are some of those treadmills out there. I actually have a little something coming in real soon that might be pretty close. It's a slide mill where the idea is your feet slide on this thing and you can go in any direction. I don't know. I'll have to talk back to you guys later, tell you how that one works out. But even with that, um, you have some other contributors like Xander. He does VR chat. And he was telling me at some point he actually got additional sensors to put on his legs or feet, I believe, to actually do more body tracking inside the game. Because the way the VR setup he has works, it has two controllers in your hands. So it tracks your hands and somewhat to an extent tracks your fingers and it tracks your head. But he was able to add additional sensors to add other points in your body on your body to incorporate into the world into the game. So there is a lot of future, a lot of really cool tech. But I'll come back in a few weeks and I'll drop a couple more to help you understand where this tech came from in its current iteration, how it works, 
and the pros and cons of different ways to go about things. That way, if you wish to join in on the VR experience, you can go. You can avoid wasting money to get the best bang for your buck experience. And trust me, you may think, oh, well, I'm a 2A guy. What's these video games going to have for me? Trust me, there's a thing for training in there. When you get in these worlds and you get surprised, you can go in scenarios where you have an enemy come out and you're just going, I have several situations that I can talk about. One of the best ones was Half-Life Alex. I was playing that and zombies start breaking in. And so there's a zombie coming down in front of me. I shoot him, shoot him, shoot him, run out of ammo. Cool. And I'm in the process of reloading and I'm trying to do the slide rack because it's not working 100% for me because I'm not getting the grip right. So I end up doing a slide drop because at least there was a button for dropping the slide forward. And then I start shooting him and all of a sudden the window breaks next to me and another zombie's coming at me. And so I just quick point shoot and take out the zombie right to my left side as it broke in the window towards me. That's the kind of stuff you're in the game. Um, On my quest, I've played Resident Evil 4 and I've been going it's like all right enemies down cool 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 and all of a sudden oh god he's getting up again he's getting up again and then having to reload the shotgun fumbling the reload trying to get it trying to run away these are actual experience you have in the game and then you realize that you know in the middle of a match in the middle of a gunfight not everything's going to go right now it's not 100 percent the same control as you're going to have in real life but you have to figure out and work your way through it and get the muscle memory to actually do these things analyze the gun what's went wrong how am i going to fix it sure it's not 100 percent in the real world but you know there's that little bit of realism and the possibility because a lot of this we can guide where the technology goes and improve it and i will say some of the best vr shooter games are the ones where you actually have to reload and i'm not talking hey yeah i'm gonna reload no more realistic reload. You actually drop the magazine. You actually pull another magazine off your waistline. You load the gun, the mag into the gun. You rack the slide. Yeah, they're actually including those in the games. This, this is getting interesting. If you have any questions, why don't you write them on in? And I'm more than sure that Weirdbeard will forward them along to me so I can answer any questions you might have. Until next week, live long and prosper. I was honestly surprised at this because given that their podcast is titled Geeks and Gadgets and Guns, I I would have thought that VR and AR would have fallen into the first two categories. I mean, please don't get me wrong. I'm very thankful for this segment. I'm just honestly surprised he didn't keep it for himself. Yeah. For those that listen to the Geeks, Gadgets and Guns podcast, podcast they frequently talk like uh, i just listened to i think they've just put out another one so i'm i think i'm one behind but they're talking about one where um they were all together and they were playing the the star trek virtual reality game where essentially they're all able ru- to run the various bridge consoles uh to uh to to complete the missions and it was super it's super interesting to listen to that and uh i have uh, i i have played i believe it was a Wellowitz um oculus rift uh was what i played at the uh the atlanta house for the nra meeting and uh that was super duper interesting though and i gotta say i would love to have one but a i don't really have that much spare time to play games anymore (sighs) but also uh but also i don't know if i've got any spot in my house that has enough space cleared out to easily play the game because when you're in that thing like there's just no world around it. So you could like absolutely just walk into a chair and just, it is just accidents waiting to happen unless you have a really well cleared out space. And I don't think I've wanted to commit to that. But one thing that I'm super interested in that I would love to see is augmented reality because I mean, and and thinking about some of the more practical stuff, obviously we got things like Pokemon go, which is super interesting, but I am like way aged out of that. Like it was always like my friend's younger brothers who were the Pokemon collectors. And so I've never gotten into the, into the Pokemans. Uh, 
And so you kids and your Pokemans. Back in my day, we played Magic the Gathering, and we liked it fine. That is absolutely true. <laughs> me, and me, and one of my good friends, we'd be playing Magic the Gathering while while his brother would be at the same his his younger brother would be at the card shop getting Pokemon cards. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, just the the neat idea of going to a physical location so that you can you can do an activity. Uh, is 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 super duper interesting using your phone but also i mean we kind of have an aspect of it it's just not tied into real life but you know i i I know i've heard you say this aaron that you'll be reading a an actual physical book and you'll just be so frustrated that you can't hit control f to try to find what you're looking for And, 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 and scan scan through on something or how now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the show notes and there's the, you know, there's the article that you're talking about and I can just click on it and it takes me right to that article and you listening to the show, you can go to, you know, assortedcalibers.com and look at the show notes of this episode and you can look at all of the aspects that we're talking about for this and, and all of David's tests for the, uh, for the Altor pistol. And, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just right there. And the ability to do that in real life as well, like to walk past a, a restaurant and just kind of click on the front door of the restaurant and suddenly their menu pops up rather than, looking through the windows to see if they have a menu available or Googling the restaurant name to see if you can find a scan, scan of their menu, et cetera, et cetera. The having that tied into your life just seems like it would just make everything just so much easier. But also you've got the whole minority report thing where <laughs> all of a sudden now you're just getting spam. Speaking of expensive things you wear over your eyes, now it's time for Egghead's third segment on night vision, where he discusses the various formats of NVGs and the pros and cons of each. Hey everybody, welcome back to the General Purpose Egghead segment. We are on episode three of our series on night vision technology. So far, we have already covered what the night vision technology is and how it works and how those devices are rated. And on episode three, we're going to talk about how they're put into practical devices, the different formats that night vision technology can come in. I'm going to cover these different formats in logical rather than chronological order. So just the order in which it makes sense to explain them, not necessarily the order in which they were first used. But in either case, the first one up is a night vision weapon scope. This was one of the first formats that was ever used, and it was used in the AN-PVS-2 Starlight scope in Vietnam. Uh, It wasn't the first night vision device, but it was pretty early on when the technology became practical. This is a format that a lot of people kind of think about and sort of gravitate to when they first think about night vision, if they're thinking about using it on a weapon. But it does have some significant disadvantages that makes it kind of a niche application. So mounting a night vision device directly to your gun, building it into a scope of some kind, or maybe having it look through a scope that you already have. uh, The advantages to that are that it's easy to use when sighting down the weapon. uh, So it's going to be pretty easy to shoot with it uh, if you're used to shooting regular optics or iron sights. Uh, The disadvantages are it's not easy to use when you're not sighting down the weapon, right? So uh, you don't typically walk around looking through everything through the sights of your rifle, right? Even if you are in in combat. One of the most important functions of a night vision device isn't just to be able to see your target, but be able to see the world around you. You need to be able to walk around and, and function as a normal human being without light. And that's something that's very difficult to do when you have to see the world through the scope of your rifle. Uh, The other disadvantage is that you have to point your rifle at something in in order to see it, which sounds like the same thing, but a slightly different angle to it. It's kind of a safety violation. Uh, If you can't see where someone is without pointing your gun at them, that introduces a lot of risks that, that aren't really necessary. This format is still used, but it's used mostly with magnified optics and clip-on night vision devices, or dedicated night vision scopes that have high magnification. It's really more of a long-range type tool. Therefore, I wouldn't really consider it to be a good place to start if you're trying to get into night vision. 
So the next category is a monocular, and this is a really good place to start, and it is where most people actually end up starting out with night vision. It's a single image intensification tube with a single lens and single eyepiece designed to go in front of one eye. Uh, when they sell these, they often sell them with weapon mounts. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, weapon mounts are generally not advised, so I wouldn't recommend using it. Uh, but the typical application is head mounted. Uh, the standard PVS-14, which is the most common monocular in use, comes with a uh, USGI J-arm, they call it, which connects it to a mount, and then the mount connects to your helmet. So what it does is it, it just holds the monocular in front of either your left or your right eye, and you can kind of flip it out of the way to stow it and then flip it back down into use. Um, the advantages of a monocular format are that you get very good peripheral vision with, uh, with your eye that it's in front of and your, your other eye. So you have good unaided peripheral vision. So if there's even a little bit of light, you can still see well enough to do some close in tasks. As we mentioned in our first episode about how the technology works, one of the consequences of the very wide aperture size is a very short focal length which means that in normal use, anything close in within arm's reach is going to be very fuzzy and difficult to see through the night vision tube. So if you need to open a pocket knife or read a map or reload a weapon or anything like that, it's best done with your unaided eye rather than through the night vision tube. The unaided eye also allows you to better gauge the level of ambient light around you. When you're wearing night vision, it's really easy to forget about how dark it is or how bright it is. So you can accidentally wander into a pool of light from moonlight or from a street light or something like that and not realize that you're being exposed. With a monocular, it's a little easier to notice those things because you have the unaided eye uh, as well in parallel with your night vision. Another advantage is that it's potentially the lightest weight of all of the head-mounted systems, which makes a surprising amount of difference because uh, another couple of ounces on your head and neck is makes a lot more difference than a couple of ounces anywhere else. So a small amount of weight has a disproportionate impact. Uh, with that said, some of the newer binocular devices are very lightweight as well and are only a couple of ounces more than a standard issue PVS-14. Monoculars are also very cost effective. You're only using one image intensification tube and that is the bulk of the cost of your device. So they can be half the cost of a set of binoculars. They're also very modular. So they make weapon mounts, uh, they make camera mounts so you can mount a camera to it. They also make bridges that allow you to take two monoculars and bolt them together into a set of binoculars. They're heavier than a dedicated set of binoculars, but you can always break them apart and separate them and loan one to a friend if you'd like. So that sort of general purpose adaptability of a monocular is a significant advantage as well. So now on to the disadvantages of the monocular format. Uh, the first disadvantage is that you don't have any depth perception when you're only looking through one eye, and that can take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, you also have a very narrow field of view. Your field of view is roughly 40 degrees, it's a bit like walking around looking at the world through a toilet paper tube. You have to very consciously point your head at anything that you want to see, and it can be a little bit unnatural at first. Uh, lastly, uh, some people say that this causes eye strain as well. Uh, walking around with one eye behind a night vision device and the other not with both eyes open can be a little bit disorienting at first. Um, I think this is kind of overblown. I've done a lot of walking around with monoculars, and I haven't had the notorious headaches that people keep talking about. And if it's dark enough that you really need night vision, your unaided eye really isn't seeing much anyway. So I don't find this a particular disadvantage, but again, um, some people have reported this, so I'm going to include it. The next format I'm going to talk about we've already touched on, and that is binoculars. So with binoculars, you have two separate image intensification tubes and you have two separate focus lenses and eyepiece lenses. So the main advantage of binoculars is that you get depth perception. So let's talk a little bit about what depth perception actually is. Depth perception relies on something called parallax, which is dependent on having two separate images from two separate points of view that you can compare to find out how far away things are. 
It's a little bit difficult to explain, but the gist of it is if you take your finger and you hold it maybe 10 inches away from your face and you look at it first through one eye and then the other, the position of your finger relative to the background appears to change when you switch eyes. The amount that it appears to change is greater the closer your finger is to your face. So comparing the relative position of an object in the images from the left and the right eye relative to the background can give you an idea of how far away it is, and that's how depth reception works. So with a binocular night vision device, you get two separate images that are separated by roughly the same distance as your eyes, and they're pointed straight forward, and you get a pretty natural experience of depth reception. This can make a big difference walking around in the woods at night when it's important for you to be able to tell if that's a hole or a stump in front of you. And because it's more natural, people generally say that it is much less likely to cause eye strain than something like a monocular. The disadvantage of going to binoculars is the additional expense. You have twice the image intensification tubes and therefore at least twice the expense. They're also typically heavier than monoculars and because they block both of your eyes, you have less peripheral vision and it's harder to gauge the ambient amount of light. A lot of binoculars are articulating and articulating means that you can take one of the sides of the binocular and just kind of pivot it up and away and that gives you a monocular-like experience where you're only using one half of the device. So this can help to mitigate the uh, peripheral vision and ambient light issues, uh, but you're still left with the additional weight and expense. The last thing I'm going to mention isn't really a disadvantage, but you don't get any more field of view than you would from a monocular. You basically have two monoculars with the same 40 degree field of view pointed in exactly the same direction. So you end up with the same 40 degree field of view. So you still have the same kind of issue you have with monoculars, which is that you have to deliberately point your head at anything you're trying to look at. So after binoculars, we're getting into the realm of clever little tips and tricks that try and mitigate some of the disadvantages of night vision. And the first one is kind of a failed experiment. This would be the biocular format. Uh, as opposed to a binocular format, the biocular format has one image intensification tube, it has one focal lens, and then it splits that image into two identical images and puts them to your left and your right eye. So it has two eyepiece lenses. This would be the PVS-7, which was the military-issued night vision for quite a while. So the advantages are that you get images in both of your eyes, so it feels much more natural. And it's much more cost effective than true binoculars since you only need one image intensification tube. Uh, the disadvantages are it's basically the worst of both worlds. You get the lack of depth perception of binoculars because you have the same image being presented to both eyes. And as we talked about earlier, depth perception relies on parallax. It relies on having two different images from two different points of view. So you don't really get any depth perception with a biocular, but you feel like you do because both eyes are seeing an image. So it gives you this false sense of everything being very flat and two dimensional. Um, the other disadvantage is that it blocks all of your peripheral vision, even worse than a lot of binoculars because the PVS-7 is fairly bulky. So you do have very little peripheral vision and it needs to be fairly close to your face in order to work. It's also heavier than a monocular and it's not modular like a monocular and you're stuck with the mounting system that it comes with, which is the bayonet style attachment. And we haven't gotten into this yet, but the bayonet style attachment is the military standard version that is not very well liked. It can be a little bit wobbly. It's perfectly functional, but the uh, aftermarket dovetail is generally considered better. Um, the other disadvantage of the PVS-7 specifically is that that bayonet mount is molded into the main body of the PVS-7. So if you were to fall and damage that mounting system, which is reasonably fragile, you have to replace the entire body of the unit. So it's much more fragile than a monocular where there's just a threaded hole that you connect the J-arm to. And if you were to break it, you would break the $40 replaceable arm rather than the entire housing. So all of this is to say that we can take the PVS-7 and put it in the failed experiment category. Uh, the one niche I think they still have is that because they have these disadvantages and because they made a ton of them, uh, you can find them for pretty darn cheap. So if you can get a PVS-7 for dramatically less than a monocular 
and you don't plan on doing a lot of high speed, low drag tuck and rolls in the middle of the night. Um, they work perfectly great for stargazing and walking the dog and kind of dorking around as long as you're not doing anything too intense that would require peripheral vision or depth perception or the ability to navigate in kind of difficult circumstances. So in contrast to the last hack, this next hack went the complete opposite direction and was quite successful. And that's quad panos. So with quad panoramic night vision goggles, you have four image intensifier tubes. Two of them in a binocular format pointed straight forward, and then one on each side pointed out and to the side. Uh, the whole assembly is pretty large. It looks kind of insectoid. You've got kind of pods pointing off in different directions, but you get a pretty incredible field of view. They're the most natural and easy to use of all night vision goggles, and uh, they get pretty rave reviews for the people who put them on their head. Uh, the disadvantages are you pretty much need to take out a second mortgage to afford one. You're talking 40k for a set of L3 GPNVG quad panoramic goggles, which are the most common. Uh, some newer ones have come out that are kind of knockoffs or, or variants on that. I think it's a, it was a Chinese knockoff that I saw that you put your own tubes in. But at the very least, you're talking four image intensification tubes, so that's four times the cost of a monocular at least. Quad panos are also heavy as sin, and that's going to be right on the front of your face. So you're definitely going to feel that in the morning after prolonged use. The last format I'm going to talk about is my personal favorite. It's still new and kind of unproven, but I think it has some significant benefits. That is going to be binocular panoramic. So this would be the Noise Fighters Pano Bridge is the brand name of the people who've made this. And it takes two monoculars and puts them together into a bridge like binoculars, but it allows you to pivot them each outward slightly. Uh, it's adjustable and you can get some of the additional field of view that you would get from quad panos. Definitely not as much, but some. And uh, it still is much more cost effective. And uh, it's just two monoculars that you attach to the device, so you can always break one off. You retain that advantage of monoculars. They're articulating, so you can swing one up into the side, so you retain that advantage of binoculars. You can have the straight binocular experience by pointing them straight forward, or you can pan them out slightly to get more field of view. It's a little bit disorienting at first, and I find that I have to, I, I never pan them out all the way to the side. That just gets a little bit too chameleon-eyed for me, and it, it, it kind of, my brain can't match up the images anymore. Uh, but if I have a significant overlap in the middle, I just kind of make the two circles look like a Venn diagram. It feels pretty natural to me, and uh, I definitely appreciate that additional field of view when I'm walking around. It feels a lot more natural. It's lighter than quad panoramics, a lot cheaper than quad panoramics. You can adjust the field of view to your preference. And the other advantage is you have two completely separate monocular devices on a bridge, so if one of them has some sort of malfunction or the battery dies, your other system is almost certainly still going to be working. So you have a little bit of redundancy there. The disadvantages of this system are that it's definitely heavier than dedicated binoculars, although it's not too bad. The, the Pano Bridge is 3D printed out of nylon. It can also take a little bit of getting used to, having your two eyes kind of pointed out sideways like a horse or something. Um, and they're durable, but they're not entirely proven yet. So they are 3D printed out of nylon, as I mentioned. So they're probably not going to be as mil-spec rugged as like a solid aluminum bridge mount. Very recently, a company called AB Night Vision came out with a dedicated binocular panoramic device called the RPNVG. And this does look like it's going to uh, remedy some of the disadvantages of the Pano Bridge. It's going to be sturdier and a little bit lighter uh, because it'll be dedicated binos. And the bodies can still be separated into a separate monocular, although that requires a, a standalone battery pack that has not yet been released. So this promises to give you almost all of the benefits of the Pano Bridge, plus a couple of other benefits. Uh, the one thing you lose is that the RPNVG is not going to be articulating like the Pano Bridge is, so you can't just swing one eye out of the way and get that monocular format when you want to do some close-in work with your unaided eye. So that's all I've got for you today. Uh, I know this was also a unusually long segment, but I felt like I had quite a bit to cover. 
this still is not an exhaustive list. I dropped a couple of brand names, but there's a lot of different brand names out there that make a lot of different devices. But I think this should help to give you a brief overview of the different types of night vision devices that you can find and their relative advantages and disadvantages. I'll see you next time when we're going to be talking about mounts and accessories and uh, lights and lasers if we have time. So I remember going to an NRA annual meeting and seeing a Jurassic Park sized Velociraptor. I, I have to say it that way because I believe the actual Velociraptor was like a little tiny, like Chihuahua sized thing. They were the size of a um, domestic uh, domestic turkey. So they were they were okay. about two and a half feet from from uh, from the from their feet to the top of their head. Right. So, so I don't know, maybe this one was the Utah Raptor or whatever, but Donaticus, just, okay. Donaticus is about that size. But, but anyway, it, it was the size of the Velociraptors you saw in the movies, and it had a set of quad panoramic NVGs on it, and the effect was humorous and surreal. Um, I guess you could call it a bino dino. That pun was just for you, Xander. <laughs> so I've attached some pictures in the show notes so you can see for yourselves. It is really, really hilarious. And also the the bit where uh, where Egghead was talking about, you know, having the adjust adjusting the binoculars so that they can give you a little bit more of a panorama. But he's like, you kind of got eyes stuck in the side of your head like a horse or a velociraptor. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was super interesting and uh oh when you said jurassic park size i've got to get my well actually i am like so bothered that that uh, michael Crichton did like so much research when he was doing that uh that book i mean he he's he was a medical doctor and just like super duper sciencey and nerdy and so he did like so much research leading up to stuff except for we've known like for ages like I want to say, I mean, the first time I read about it was in like 321 Contact Magazine. K kids ask your grandparents. God, I'm old. <laughs> but like 321 Contact Magazine had like a cover of the magazine had a Velociraptor before anyone knew, knew about them, <laughs> before they were cool and with feathers. Because everyone knew the Velociraptor has fe had feathers. We have preserved Velociraptor feathers, you know, that we have in like amber and such. And why Crichton made them scaly, I don't know. I don't know. He, I mean, he made it a key point to make the, the fact that the dinosaurs were warm blooded, which was also, well, strongly suspected at the time. But yeah, the ve Velociraptors had feathers. They, they didn't look like that. <laughs> they also didn't wear night vision goggles, so th that one's better. <laughs> and may I note that oh did my heart drop when I saw the uh the, the let me re review the show notes so I get the the uh the the pano binos the 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 super duper like like panoramic uh uh NVGs as one of those like oh you got to shell out like new car uh, uh money just to get to be in your own boogaloo meme <sighs> they just look so funny when you see the four little eyes. And actually, my wife has the new iPhone that's got like the eight zillion cameras on the back of it. And I think it looks like those night vision cockles. <laughs> I've seen some, uh, I, I think they're decals for the iPhones so that the lenses line up with a picture of Schwarzenegger from Commando oh. with the the missile launcher. Yes. Oh, that just reminded me. Yeah, I I want to I want to see one a phone a phone case that yeah that lines up that lines up with the uh, with those that uh, that makes that makes your phone look like Metal Gear from the original Metal Gear games because <laughs> it had one of those thingies too. You can kids ask your folks? Before there was PlayStation, there was there was me sne sneaking around on the original NES. <sighs> you know who doesn't make me feel old, Aaron? Our patrons, our patrons, and our listeners. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to me. Otherwise, I would be in a nursing home eating jello. <laughs> Very special thanks to all of our listeners. And of course, a special thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. Uh, if you want to, you can become a Patreon patron by going to patreon.com slash assorted calibers podcast to sign up. You'll get things like an early release of the podcast. Plus, we've got bonus content. We got blooper reels. We got the ACP film tracks. Oh my God. We have done an entire month of spooky movies, starting with Night of the Living Dead. And uh, yeah, it's it, there's there's going to be good stuff, including the uh, the the, the last uh, the last of the spooky movies because it's Halloween. I think I still want to do. I got another movie I want to do, but we'll we'll see how the gang feels like it. But uh, there'll be. Uh, one more movie dropping when uh, when, when, when this drops uh, so uh, yeah the um, so we get we got we get film tracks of spooky movies and of course the ACP Magnum. also please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts subscribe to us on the platform of your choice and share the show with your friends both online and off you can get more from me at my blog which is weirdworld.com and you can hear me weekly on handgun radio on the firearms radio network but why would you want to do that that show's terrible well, I mean, that one host is pretty good. Ryan's cool. Yeah. But that other guy, I hate him. Oh, he's such an idiot. <laughs> he is. And he smells bad. <laughs> and you can get more from me at linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linktree.e forward slash Aaron Paulette. All one word. I laugh every time. <laughs> and thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. He's an idiot who can't read a calendar, and I'm the fool who believes him without double-checking. Our derp is assorted, and so is our podcast. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night.